Vinny, very much appreciated. Thank you for your kind introduction and also for the opportunity to speak to all of you. I'm sorry that I was late. The reason for this is that I'm running another conference that I'm hosting today in parallel, also via Zoom. Uh, and one of the big advantages of, uh, uh, of, of the times in which we are at the moment is, is that you can participate simultaneously <laughs> at two conferences from your, from your home office, uh, which was obviously not uh, possible in times before COVID. So thank you so much. Um, the, the topic that I chose um, as a lawyer is um, in how far law can steer the development of artificial intelligence and if so, how. And uh, in order to give a short answer to this question, I would kindly um, simply uh, draw your attention to my second, to my last name, which is Forgo. Forgo is a Hungarian name. And Hungarians, as I learned, uh, have the tendency, like possibly many other uh, members of small nations, to identify that everything was already solved by other members of their nationality. So whenever you meet a Hungarian, be please be sure that he will, uh, uh, he will draw your attention to other Hungarians insisting that everything uh, that was developed is Hungarian. And therefore, the, the answer to the question um, that I asked in my, uh, in my introductory slide, whether there is any steering possible from um, uh, a legal point of view on uh, AI, uh, is also already answered by a Hungarian, uh, by Andrew Grove in this case, uh, who is um, one of the co-founders of Intel, as you certainly know better than me, um, and who became famous with very good reasons for one quote that I would like to use here, which is that a fundamental rule in technology says that whatever can be done will be done. So that's the keynote in a way. Can law steer the development of AI and if so, how? Um, uh, in technology, there is a fundamental principle that is whatever can be done will be done. Therefore, the answer is yes. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Let's go um, to the debate. Um, actually, that would be, uh, in a nutshell, the presentation. Um, obviously, um, I can also extend this a little bit further because Irini and Bodo um, uh, rightly expected me to speak a little bit longer than those three minutes. Um, and I, I will try to follow this by, by making a little bit more of argumentation now about why uh, Grof is right with the statement and why we have a problem with this um, here in Europe in particular. And, um, the, this is a specifically European pro problem, I would say, and I would like to give a little bit more of emphasis on this. Um, when you look into um, the world, um, uh, that's uh, something that you as computer scientists know much better than I do. Um, this world is um, in now for more than 50 years um, under the influence of something that I would call digitalization. And since then, uh, this whole process of uh, more and more data that gets more and more global in more in less and less time, uh, is ongoing um, and there is very little hope uh, that this will change. Uh, so most probably uh, this will continue to happen. And if this is going to continue to happen, uh, the question that lawyers like myself need to answer is in how far and where and under which preconditions the law uh, should intervene and interfere um, in, in, this, uh, in this spinning wheel uh, that moves um, so quickly. Um, and uh, my, my first hypothesis here is that uh, the, the legal debate uh, that we have been seeing um, on this um, in, um, in, in the last years um, increasing, that the legal debate is on the one hand uh, by far too late, and on the other hand, it's by far too early. Uh, it's by far too late because of the fact that all of us are already very much used to uh, automated decision making. I will not use, at least for the moment, not use uh, the term AI um, because I know even less than you what exactly this might mean. Um, so, um, so law is late because um, we are all uh, used uh, to automated decision making in our daily life um, and uh, this happens at all kinds of, um, of our daily experience. It starts with 
Google Maps uh, deciding where we should go, what the right traffic um, 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 mode would be to uh, go somewhere. It continues with what we see when we do a Google search. It continues what we see when we actually interact with our peers on social networks. And it finally also starts already to appear when we go into more serious scenarios such as treatment um, and diagnosis in, uh, in the medical environment, um, uh, such as in this example here, uh, Watson uh, from IBM claiming that uh, a treating physician would be able to quickly generate a list of potential treatment options ranked by applicability and recommended for consideration and not recommended. It also is the case when we uh, drive, this is a screenshot from a picture that was taken out of a, um, a, a vehicle that, an, an Uber vehicle in this case, by the way, that was taken 1.2 seconds uh, before this happened. Um, so we had a deadly uh, accident in this case. Um, and uh, we see all this, all these tendencies from car driving to uh, medical scenarios to our daily, um, daily uh, experiences in social media, etc. We see all this uh, under the presumption that uh, somebody, uh, some human in some of these situations might be able to intervene before this is going to happen. So in principle, all this is developed in all the cases I know under the precondition that in principle, humans are those holding the, 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 the wheel, uh, the steering wheel in their hands. And in principle, they could, if they wanted to intervene. Um, a very good paradigm for this paradigm, in my view, is a screenshot that I would like to share with you which came uh, to my attention because of the very um, unfortunate situation all of us who are academics are at the moment when it comes to distance uh, exams. Um, many of you, uh, like us here in Vienna, were probably confronted in the last month with the situation that exams needed to be undertaken on a, on a home office basis. So no, um, no presence, no physical presence at universities possible. And the, uh, the, the, the interesting question then was when it, and still is, unfortunately, when it comes to exams, um, whether or not uh, these exams should be organized in a way in which uh, the professor accepts that students are able to do all kinds of things that they normally do when they are online, meaning that they communicate with others, that they collect data, that they uh, copy something out of the internet, etc., or whether there should be any technical measures in place trying to hinder students exactly this. And the screenshot that I show you here now, and I will um, show you the text uh, in a second, a little bit more closer, uh, the, uh, the screenshot is from a company called Respondus uh, trying to do the latter, so trying to control what students are doing when they are, um, when they are on, in an exam situation. And uh, this control um, is rather rigid. It includes uh, the way students may use their web browser, their text up, um, um, for programs, in how far they may or may not use their video camera, etc. And the explanation in this uh, product on uh, in in our interest in our interest here now is the following, uh, and this is a literal uh, the lit a literal a quote. So at the heart of this uh, software, there are in place advanced algorithms for facial detection, motion and lighting to analyze the student and examination environment. Uh, this is then further developed and developed and in all uh, monitor AI analyzes dozens of factors such as whether multiple faces appear within the video frame or if the person who started the exam switches to a different person along the way, etc. And then now this is the interesting part of the quote. The data then flows into the review priority system to help instructors quickly evaluate the proctoring results. So at the end, this is the assumption, there is someone, there is someone, there is a human who finally takes the final decision whether or not something that was evaluated by the machine should be then uh, put under further um, examination or not. So this is the paradigm. 
And the question that I would like to answer now together with you is in where does this paradigm come from uh, when you look into it uh, from a legal perspective and in how far is it useful when you look into it from a fundamental perspective? The answer to the second question, by the way, will be the answer for my argument why I think that the legal uh, debate comes too early. Um, um, but let me come back to this a little bit later. So where does this come from? Actually, when you look into this from a European perspective, it probably comes from GDPR. GDPR is in a way um, responsible for everything, also for this, because GDPR draws quite some uh, interesting distinctions at the very beginning, but quite some interesting consequences um, in a later stage. The main distinction that uh, GDPR draws is um, a distinction between personal and non-personal data. If there is no personal data, there is no GDPR and there is no data protection. The problem now is that when this distinction was invented, which was somewhere in the 70s or 80s of the 20th century, it was probably still rather simple to say whether something was personal because a person was identifiable or whether something was not personal because a person was not identifiable. That was easy because there were some indicators like a name or a pseudonym or a number, etc., that hinted that something might be personal and all the rest was not under review. Obviously, this becomes more and more complex the more and more data there is, and it becomes more and more complex the more data is used to um, interfere with human decision making because in the moment when something leads into decision making processes on human humans and human behaviors, obviously uh, something which looks uh, non-personal becomes personal very quickly. And there's the second distinction that is made within GDPR that is important and that also comes from the somewhere, probably in this case even from the 90s in some way of the 20th century, which is the distinction between sensitive and non-sensitive data. Sensitive is everything which under a European understanding is very much connected, very closely connected with uh, the, uh, the personality, the personal details of a human being, such as, for example, um, sexual orientation um, or health um, or political beliefs, etc. So this is, um, this is uh, sensitive. And again, this was probably relatively similar um, to distinguish in the 80s. It's much more difficult, obviously, today because uh, my uh, my daily uh, routine uh, in using uh, a specific uh, traffic um, route to my office might indicate something about my health status or it might indicate something about my religious beliefs or my political beliefs because I'm walking instead of taking a car, etc. So there's plenty of room of, um, of interpretation here. Um, in theory, therefore, GDPR has a very limited scope because it only deals with personal data and within personal data it then draws this important uh, distinction between sensitive and non-sensitive and makes the processing of non-sensitive data legal in many cases. In practice uh, this very limited scope is increasing everywhere and makes things so complex. And this is the reason why we probably need to look also as a non-lawyer a little bit more into detail what uh, GDPR exactly says about our problem. And the good news is there is a, a clause, there is an article specifically dealing with the problem. The bad news is I don't understand it. And as I don't understand it, chances are not that low that other people don't understand it either. Why this? Uh, because Article 22 starts where that's the article. So if you want to read this, Article 22 of GDPR is the source to look into. Article 22 starts with a very easy to read um, um, section one saying that the data subject shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning him or her or similarly significantly affects him or her. So this is, I don't know, but it's the source for the outcome that there is always a human being, at least in theory, finally deciding in all those scenarios that I mentioned to you or, uh, or mentioned to you, or whether this is the, uh, the cultural precondition that led 
to all these scenarios and the assumption that there are humans behind them finally deciding that is enshrined in this article. So I can't decide this question, but at least I can decide or I can hint you to the fact that this is the reason, the legal reason why uh, product makers such as the proctoring um, example before or, or, or your local uh, wheel, um, um, uh, steering wheel in your, in your car, etc., insist on that it's finally you taking the decision whether you turn the wheel or you don't. Um, it's most probably because of this, Article 22, Section 1. So this reads relatively easily from a legal perspective. Obviously, as I tried to make an argument out of, this is technically very difficult because it's very, tech, very difficult to draw the line between preparation of a decision taken by a human and decision taken by the human. But also legally, it's not that easy if you, unfortunately, if you look then into article um, uh, two, section two of this article, saying that paragraph one, giving you this principle here, shall not apply, meaning therefore that automated decision-making is legal in these cases, shall not apply if the decision is necessary, first case for a contract, second case, is based on explicit consent. This is uh, letter C of this. And third case, if there is an authorization coming from the national or the European law, that um, automated decision-making may be legal, provided that there are suitable measures in place to safeguard the data subject's right. This is a typical GDPR approach, saying in principle it's illegal, but however, it may be legal if there is a national clause allowing this or a European clause allowing this and there are suitable measures in place. This means that from a legal point of view, when you purely read Article 22 as it stands here, everything that I showed you before, um, any of those scenarios might be perfectly legal and more scenarios that you might think about, provided that either the data subject affected is in a contractual situation with the controller, or the data subject has given his or her explicit consent, or there is a national law allowing that this um, automated decision take making takes place. And then, if we are at this stage, obviously the whole ethical debate, whether or not such a law should be provided, is in full stake. And this is why the, um, again, why the, uh, the legal debate comes too late, because all these developments um, are already there, and all those legal slash ethical um, issues need to be answered also um, from a fundamental point of view. By the way, they are answered in some ways and in a way, in some cases where computer scientists probably are, were not too intensely involved in because you do something useful with your life, different from lawyers. Um, um, but lawyers think about those things and they produce laws that are coming out of this, uh, such as this one here. This is an example from the, uh, from the German um, law on administrative procedure, Verwaltungsverfahrensgesetz explicitly allowing um, allowing automated decision making in administrative procedures but again only they only if there is a law explicitly allowing this and only if the software used has no room of autonomous decision taking if there is no ms and this is a typical legal term in german meaning a voluntative element in uh, in the decision making uh, that could be used by the machine. Similarly, by the way, uh, Article 37 of the German Data Protection Act doing quite the same. So there are laws, and there are laws uh, that uh, that answer the question uh, in how far uh, automated decision making could or could not be uh, could or could not be uh, taken without. A human being at the end of finally making the decision. And the question then appears whether or not uh, this should be limited and in how far this should be limited. And this is now the reason uh, where in my view the law, uh, in, in particular the European law, is by far too early because 
on the one hand, computer scientists are not really involved in this debate, as I tried to make an argument before. But on the other hand, there are plenty of lawyers and there are ethical experts and there are politicians and all other people uh, of this kind developing all kinds of papers on this that might have an impact on the future development, such as, for example, uh, this is a communication from the European Commission uh, from two years ago. Uh, dealing with uh, AI from a regulatory point of view, uh, indicating that uh, the Commission will closely follow uh, the GDPR application in the field and will uh, um, communicate with data protection boards of the member states. Quite similar um, on from the European Commission, a paper coming from a high-level expert group on artificial intelligence in brackets and the law. Uh, give coming with all kinds of uh, rather precise um, indicators what the law should or should not uh, respect in those cases um, um, and um, added by further papers such as um, um, a German in this case um, opinion from the German uh, Commission on Data Ethics providing um, an opinion of 240 pages last year on, uh, on uh, AI and algorithms and liability for those, indicating now that there should be some kind of um, ex-ante control of everything that is developed in uh, the field and has some kind of potential to have a negative impact on the fundamental rights of the data subjects affected, and then going into all kinds of additional um, additional requirements that I will not quote here for reasons of timing, but that you can read if you are able to read German um, in the slides later. Um, so plenty of proposals of regulating all this. The most extreme example that I found um, is a French law uh, making it illegal to analyze the behavior of uh, judges in France by means of um, automated decision making slash AI um, and, um, and, uh, and putting uh, the risk of up to five years in jails in jail for, to all of those who, um, who, who do not follow this law. Um, so uh, that is perhaps the most extreme example I know where the Lord now actively tries um, to steer the development, but I want to remind you uh, to, from the beginning uh, that uh, this saying um, is still in place and in my view still valid, so that uh, whatever can be done will be done. However, not necessarily then in Europe, which brings me to the last part of this presentation. Um, uh, to, the, uh, to start with this, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the, uh, the president of the, of the commission, now um, uh, published before she came into office um, a paper called My Agenda for Europe, where she clearly states that um, AI um, are um, subject to concern for her um, and that in her first 100 days in office, she will put forward legislation for a coordinated European approach on the human and ethical implications of AI. One of the outcomes of this, by the way, are all those white papers uh, that I mentioned before. Um, so something is going to happen and, um, um, and, and there is more that is going to happen because digitalization with all those unclear details is a top priority for the Commission and uh, we, we will see a lot of further uh, rules on this in the near future. So people like myself will be very busy in the next years to understand what the Commission is proposing here. People like you will be very busy to understand in how far uh, this has or does not have an impact on what you're doing here within uh, European borders. Um, this is, in my view, as I said, on the one hand too late, but it's also on the other hand too early. It's too early because there is nothing uh, uh, relevant um, to uh, regulate on a European level here. And there is nothing relevant to regulate here because the development um, of all these um, technologies takes place at different, in different places of the world. Um, this is a screenshot now from um, statistics that are taken from the European Commission indicating that Europe when it comes to digitalization is far from being in the lead. All of you know this, uh, we are somewhere in the middle or below uh, and or in the lower end of the, of the scale. 
um, all over in Europe uh, and we have not managed to change this, although there has been a lot of policy making in order to make this better. We are still in a kind of sandwich position as Enisa puts it in one of her papers last year, somewhere um, um, in between uh, the Chinese and South Korean hardware development and the US-based software development and somewhere in the middle there is the European Union trying to regulate the field. Um, we are uh, the patty in the hamburger. Um, as Enisa puts it, in an increasingly globalized world, Europe has often presented itself as a champion of values. However, the EU's normative power alone cannot guarantee the digital sovereignty of its citizens or its businesses. To regain its influence and shed its status as an ICT industry lightweight, Europe needs to deliver European champions in the ICT sector that succeed in the marketplace. And governments, as Anisa puts it, need to act as a stimulus and not an inhibitor to this progress. In an increasingly interconnected world, the European ICT sector should be strengthened and stimulated to improve its competitiveness in the global marketplace as well as in the domestic marketplace. All kinds of additional recommendations coming from Anisa then putting it um, more into detail. I can't go into detail here due to timing reasons because I still want to stretch the point that uh, even the US see themselves at the moment um, to be under pressure from, um, uh, the Ch from Chinese uh, competitors. And um, uh, everything that is done here in Europe in this would not come for free. Everything that would be coming in this case would produce significant costs. So for example, if, you, if we were to decide that we no longer want to use Huawei um, as a 5G technology, um, some of the uh, German um, telecom providers argued already uh, almost a year ago that this would cost, uh, I don't know, about 55 billion euros. So it's a fantastic um, uh, amount again, and that it would cause a delay in, in, the, um, in the rollout of all this uh, of not less than 18 months, which is, as you know, quite a significant amount of time uh, in this uh, quickly developing environment. Um, so everything that we do here will come with costs and everything that we do on a regulatory, um, on a regulatory field will therefore need to answer the question how much this is worth to European society and how much this is worth um, to the European legislators. And this debate, as I said before, needs to be connected with the possibilities coming from the technical environment and it needs to be undertaken bringing lawyers and computer scientists and uh, sociologists and political scientists together in one room um, and not um, continuing with uh, the status as I see it at the moment, which is that everyone is having his or her own debate in his or her own filter bubble. Thank you very much. Uh, that was my input. I